So we'll wait for a couple of minutes to get people signed on before we begin. So we are hosting uh, Isadora and Teresa today. They are they are here. <clears throat> So let's uh, let's begin. Our first uh, okay. artist is Isadora Stowe, and Isadora is a uh, uh, teacher and and painter and sculptress, and you do installations, really, Isadora. It seems just phenomenal work. Can I just hand it over to you, and you can sure, know yeah, what I you're can. About? Sure, I'm going to share my screen so. I'm going to go ahead and share with you uh, some of my work and then what I'm thinking about doing in Italy in relationship to the work that I make. So um, I'm an educator. I teach fine arts. I'm a professor of fine arts. Uh, my specialty is 2D design, but 2D, two-dimensional work, but I branched out into three-dimensional and fourth-dimensional work. And these are just some of my students creating kind of more traditional work. Um, I'm also an, a single parent. And I'm very active in the artist mother community. I teach a course on professional practices and I'm on um, some different boards and committees uh, national, regional, binational. Um, and I was also just featured in the book, The Motherhood of Art. And I'm telling you these things. So I'm very involved in my community. And of course, all the things that I'm telling you about are these very layered aspects of, of who I am. But I think of art as this exp expression of the tension of being human human right so when i think about my work i think about how do i connect to that how, how does that connection happen and how do you bring that connection for other people from the tension of being a human um, into the work that we make so um, i'm showing you one of my series this is my kiddo uh, working alongside me in my studio and on the right is a, a painting that we made together so I use her drawings and then I layer my drawing on top of it. And then I layer another painting and fuse those together to create the work. Um, even though this was years ago, I, I'm just gonna give you a snippet of, of some of the ways that I've created layers. So I also, um, at one point owned an archeological company. I also have a degree in anthropology, cultural anthropology. And I was using the topographical maps to layer my drawings and my child's drawings um, all together, places that I had actually physically walked and, and the physical areas of my hometown and where um, I lived for a time in Oaxaca, Mexico when I was a kid. And, and also I've worked in Texas and um, had shows and friends and, and reasons to go over the border many times. So it's actually maps of the, of the binational region. Um, and then I, put these things together to create um, these kinds of layered maps with the images in an actual installation with the work as well. So as you can see, I'm kind of obsessed uh, with layers, also known as palimpsest, um, which is what I wanted to focus on for uh, the course, which is uh, the definition is that things with diverse layers or aspects apparent beneath the surface. Um, and something that's reused or altered, but still bearing visible tracer tracer um, of its original form. And one of the reasons why I came upon that word, it's not a word that was actually in my vernacular until thinking about this course and thinking about what I wanted to do. Um, when I was starting to think about um, kind of the materiality of, of Italy, when I think about Italy and I, I think about, you know, the Middle Ages and I also teach art history. So I'm thinking about these things and talking about these things all the time. And I was thinking about them in terms of layered and, um, um, manuscripts during medieval times, a lot of the times they would be washed and then the ink would be kind of taken off and they would reuse the paper to place on top of each other. And that's where that word palimpsest um, also comes from. And so in my own work, I've also started to layer kind of a multi-sensory aspect to the work. So it wasn't enough that I was making these layers, um, but I also wanted to create a way that when you entered into the installations, into the work, you were kind of getting all of your senses being hit at once, much like if you're walking into a Gothic cathedral, um, you know, they started using stained glass and started using choirs to kind of create this all encompassing um, relationship with the church when people would start to, when they were trying to bring people um, back into the church and, and into the church. 
So um, this is an installation detail from that same show where I'm using light and I eventually start to use sound in this work as well. Um, but as the, the light changed uh, during the day, um, things start to appear differently inside of the room. And then this is the video that's projected on the wall. And I'm taking the, the um, topographical maps that have been abstracted along with this imagery and all of this iconography and putting them together in these videos that move um, that you're able to see in the installations. Um, and then I continue to kind of and try to envelop the viewer so it becomes more and more intense uh, when you're inside of these installations and you're able to go into one space and then go back out into another. And they start to move these, in, these um, actually uh, move in the space. Um, but I'm really interested in kind of how those sensory experiences can be um, translated and then brought in for the viewer. So all the imagery that you're looking at, it's this iconography that I've used over and over again that's been changed into different um, materials. So this is mylar and acrylic, and then there's light gels so that when you enter it, you're a part of this installation and you're, you're able to see all these actual shadows that are produced. There's about four or five shadows. You can kind of see it on the right um, that are produced by those color combinations and by the viewer walking through uh, the actual installation. This is another one um, with the artwork uh, that is inside of the installation with the light gels, along with um, projection mapping. So I also use a video that's projected in the exact shapes of the objects that are on the wall. And so the videos are moving inside of the shapes um, with the colored light gels. And then as the viewer comes in, they're kind of enveloped uh, by all of the color and they change the installation as well. Um, so it's really kind of this obsession with having people experience these sensory aspects, these multi-dimensional aspects and layers of the work when you're coming into the work. Um, and I'm using the same iconography over and over again that I'm gathering from my life and repurposing and repeat repeating over and over again. So this is, uh, they also light up, they're uh, light sensitive. So this is in the installation and this is what it looks like outside of the installation. Um, but as you can see, it's very layered. So it's, it's um, spray paint, there's ink, um, and then there's silk screen on top of it. This is an example of what it looks like when it starts to glow. So you start to see the other layers underneath it that start to come through. Um, and what I want to explore with people in the course is I want to make our own sur surrealist uh, syntax or really your own visual language based off of experiences. So when you're seeing different objects and you're relating to the world and you're thinking about Italy specifically as we are in that specific place um, and how we're relating through our senses and then recreating this kind of visual language where we're taking an object or objects and then we're kind of placing them together to create another surrealistic image and surrealism is is just kind of um you know it's a movement that happened after world war ii which was about uh liberation and talking about the inner self and so then we can kind of make this language that we're going to put together um, that's about all these things that we're experiencing through our senses um, and creating our own um, sur surrealistic syntax from our physical experiences from being in that place and what we've brought there right with who we are as human beings and what we're experiencing. Um, and this is just to give you an idea of how those drawings then will be um, transferred onto a, a larger substrate of anyone's choice and then um, we'll work with color to kind of fill those in. Um, and one of the reasons why I'm so interested also in um, looking at our worlds and trying to interpret them is um, I found out that I have the fourth cone, which is this uh, cone in your eye that allows you to see millions of colors that you wouldn't normally see. And you can have this if you're female and you have a grandfather who's colorblind. Um, but what I think is so interesting about this phenomenon is that um, you, oh, men can never have it. Uh, they cannot be born with it, but they found that in landscape male painters that they actually develop it. So what this means is the more that we're kind of looking at things and we're looking at color and we're examining our worlds, we can actually start to see more, like we physically will see more. Um, and so that's what I'm really interested in kind of exploring and thinking about in Italy is how we're, we're 
understanding how spirituality was translated in a time and in a place and and how is food translated and this experience of what we're seeing and nature and all these geometric forms and all this kind of beauty and insight and the different people we get to meet and their experiences and our layers of, of who we are and how all those things will kind of be translated into our own languages um, and put together. So thank you so much. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. <laughs> and we can we can unmute if you'd like. I found the your installation absolutely fascinating. I have three questions on it. Number one, how many people did it take you to do this? And do you have an engineering degree to work with all the lights and to figure all this out? And then whenever you take it down. What happens to it? These are wonderful questions. Thank you for asking me that. Because um, sometimes people don't understand. It takes literally like a whole team. So mm -hmm. I, um, I, what I did is I kind of, I asked the electromagnetic department at uh, UTEP, which is a, it's a university I used to teach at, um, if they would help me do this thing. So they helped me figure it out. And I talked to another uh, artist, my friend Laura Turan, who's an incredible artist, and um, she helped me with the projection mapping. So I figured that out. But then it took um, over a year, the video of the projection mapping mm -hmm. to map that out. Um, and then when I went there to install it, there were about 12 people helping me over the course of um, three days for us to install it. And then we deinstalled it. Um, and then it just came home with me. It's, it's all wrapped up <laughs> over here in the corner. <laughs> um, but the artwork is also kind of in here from that show and all over and some of it l luckily sold. So, um, but yeah, I store a lot of the That's stuff really when cool. it comes back. It's incredible. Beautiful. <laughs> oh, thank you. I really appreciate it. The, uh, <clears throat> what kind of questions do you have for people? Because they're, uh, most of the people here have been to La Romita. Um, I have so many questions, but um, I guess, I mean, I have a kind of like some, some questions about if that sounds like that would be something that would be doable or something that people would be interested in having been in that space already um, and being to the same site again um, at La Romita, um, if that's something that, if that's a kind of course that would be intriguing to you to be able to translate those relationships and, and the way that you're feeling in that space. I think it would be great if you if we could keep all the stuff you have on the walls once you're done with the class. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I speak? I don't know. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I've been there and the, the studio is a wondrous place, but I don't know how technically um sophisticated it is if you want to do this layered with lighting i don't know if you can do that what do you think edmund well i mean we could do anything but but i i think are you <clears throat> i think that um your processes isadora sound really fascinating and yeah. um were you kind of asking whether about that well like whether we can yeah. technically handle um, <laughs> that yeah, kind no, of project or I wasn't thinking of light at all. I was just thinking about the the drawings that we would make and the paintings that we would make. That out you of could do. That you could do. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I think it, the lighting comes later when you take it home or how it would sit in space. But maybe yeah. also, uh, how is the food? You know, is the wonderful. Food <laughs> the food's <delicious. laughs> very very healthy, rustic Italian food. Wonderful. Well, but <laughs> And and wine. <clears throat> yes, local, wine. local wine. I, I forgot I forgot about that. That's a huge perk. Lunch and share. dinner. <laughs> I've never drank so much in my life. No, no. <laughs> but the wine is not very strong. You can have two or three glasses and you don't fall on the on your face. <laughs> it's definitely it's it's more fresh wine. It's not yeah. uh yeah. Yeah. No, I think the the interest in techniques is something that's always um it seems that every artist i know whether they are 
you know, married to pastels or to watercolor or whatever, everyone is interested in the other techniques available, especially kind of techniques that can be transferred into, into other media, you know, that, um, so I think you're. The idea of lay layering really appeals to me. I've never done it, yeah. but I can't, I'm not coming this time this year. Well, we're talking about 2022. Ah. Uh, I mean, there, the richness, the, the richness of, of Italy for iconography and for symbols is something that, that uh, I mean, it's always there. It's always in the background. And it's a, the, the idea of a workshop that is really focused on that. I know that many other workshops, many other uh, teachers highlight different pieces of it. And I've seen that sort of uh, the, those things making their way into sketchbooks, into into people's journals, into in even the focus of larger paintings. But the idea of using that to create syntax and using it more um, you know, less as a single point focus, but more systematically, I think would be, I, I think it's a really you know, compelling idea and in a space that would really support it. I mean, sure, yeah, agreed. I really like the idea, though, of the layering of, of putting um, an under under uh, an underpinning of a map or something, and then putting interesting things upon it. I, it's, it's, I've, ne I, I've never done that. Yeah, I could. That's. I'm glad you brought that up because I'll do some research too on the maps that actually exist, so I can I can bring the iconography, a lot of the topographical iconography, like the historical maps too, so people have access to that. Would be interesting. You make copies of them, bring them for the students. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Great. I love that idea. And I love getting to research that even if nobody uses it. <laughs> I'm like, that sounds so interesting <laughs> to me. <laughs> what are the main materials? Are you working with acrylics mainly or? Yeah, acrylics, ink, um, watercolor, gouache. Um, I think all of those, and, and gouache is so portable. So, um, I was thinking more al along the lines of, of gouache because gouache acts like acrylic. It acts like watercolor, and um, it, it and if you're packing a lot of it, you know it's it's you can reignite it with water, so it has a lot more flexibility than acrylic. But we can also use acrylic as well. I I use all three of those at the same time, um, interchangeably, kind of to do a different texture, different this or that. But I thought I would also bring some of those. So even if people were working with, with just gouache, we could throw in a little bit of acrylic or with it as well. Did you say it was, you add water to the gouache, you, you bring it dry and add the water? Um, yeah, you can, you can do, it, it comes liquid form, but it'll relive if you add water to it, it'll come back alive. But it also has just so much more of an opaqueness. So it has more of like this inert white pigment in it than watercolor does. So it's able to, you get a white, white, you get a black, black, instead of watercolor, it can, you know, there is. depending on the grade of it, it, it won't necessarily do that for you. Um, but gouache, I like because of that interplay where it can look so flat as well. Um, nice. yeah. I just asked to use Kiritaki watercolors. Have you tried those? Which ones? Sorry? Kiritaki. I don't they're know. Almost, they're sort of a little bit like acrylic and I suppose a little bit like gouache, intense colors. Um, you can layer, you can put a light on top of the dark. Um, they're really beautiful. I love them. What was it called again? Can you put it in it's, the... It's K-U-R-E-T-A-K-E. -E. What country does it come from? They're Japanese, I guess. Aha. Uh -huh. Karutake. Kuretake. It's K U R E T A K E. You said? Oh, yes. I, it up. I've no, I don't know of it. I don't know if it's a brand or if it's a kind of um, a it's water a based pigment. It's, oh, it's a brand? It's a, mm -hmm. So it must be, it's a water based pigment? Yes. Yes. Mm. Oh, neat. Oh. They come in palettes with lots of color. Oh. That sounds great. Okay. I'm like, I've never met a. Uh, art supply did not love, so I'm excited to look those. <laughs> right, I know. <laughs> Thank you so much, Isadora. Um, Thank you. Thanks for your time. Let's uh, introduce our second artist, who is Teresa Oaxaca. 
Oaxaca. And I just heard you say that you lived in Oaxaca when you were a youth. Yes. Amazing. Yeah. Very connected. So, Teresa, you are muted right now. <clears throat> All right. Yeah, Hello. Good. Nice to meet you, everyone. Um, I live in Washington, D.C., and I'm a professional oil painter. So I do a lot of uh, kind of surrealistic but realistic imagery, and I use an old master technique. Um, behind me, I have a painting that I might do some demonstration on. And uh, over there, I have uh, a big collection of pigments. And so um, one of the other things I do is teach how to make paint. So I can make oil paint, watercolor, ink, um, gouache. But, but usually, I just make oil paint. But I, I do like having that um, kind of museum of colors. And um, I'm, I think that I'm going to share my screen a little bit just to show you a, a bigger range of my work while I kind of explain what I do. So I went to school in, in Florence, Italy in 2005, 2010. And so I was kind of trained in a European 19th century style because, you know, as much as we love the old masters, they were just so long ago. So it's, it's too long ago to really know what they did. Um, but the 19th century is a lot more accessible. So um, it, it's very, um, I guess you could say like, like traditional with the goal of producing like heirloom oil paintings you know, and as such, you end up doing a lot of portrait commissions and um, kind of portraits of ambassadors and, um, you know, things like this. But I also just, um, aside from doing commissions, I do um, a lot of my own work. Um, so I have um, just a lot of paintings that I've uh, done. Um, this is one behind me. Um, lately, I've been getting interested in uh, incorporating landscape. And so I think one of the interesting things that could be done at La Romita is maybe some landscapes. Um, I kind of have an unusual approach. What I, what I tend to do is just wander around and enjoy the outdoors. And then I go in and kind of paint from my imagination and photographs. And um, I, I tend to do a lot of uh, like running in the woods and just sitting and reading fairy tales in the woods. So I, I kind of try to just um, get a sense of the place and enjoy myself. And um, uh, I am familiar with the drinking in, in Europe. I have to say, I, I quite enjoyed um, teaching in Belgium over a couple of summers, um, but there it was beer. I like I like um, <laughs> I like the beer too. But but I'm glad to hear that the wine in in La Romita is fresh and light. That that's that's going to be very helpful. Um, though, if I had to choose, I would say I'm more of a tea drinker. That's my biggest um, uh, favorite. Um, so I do a lot of still lives as well. This is part of a bigger painting. And um, I kind of like this um, cycle of life and, and celebration of natural world and, and mythology. So um, th this woman has a, uh, a pen horns kind of growing out like Greek mythology. So I'm also kind of interested in um, religions and, and past cultures. And that's one of the things I love about Europe is that you see so many different, um, you know, parts of history coming through, and it's so visible on the surface in, in uh, Italy, especially. Um, yeah, and I, I was studying in Florence for five years, um, so I, I was also enjoying that. And um, so, yeah, a lot of my work is kind of uh, influenced by European history and uh, a little bit by Mexican um, imagery as well. Um, though I haven't been to Mexico that much, unfortunately, but uh, I was in Mexico City last year and I really loved it. And I'm looking forward to going back. Um, I, I love the whole Comedia del Arte characters. So I, I've done a lot of uh, clowns before in the series. And um, as I said, I like surrealism and the, um, the kind of Viennese secessionist movement in the late 19th century, early 20th century was a big inspiration for me. And as far as modern art goes, you know, we have a great collection here in DC in the East Wing of the National Gallery. And I've kind of got a thing for Rothko and Barnett Newman. So um, for my birthday two years ago, I was teaching at a art school in, in Princeton and um, I had a kind of a nice time in front of fire at this um, Nassau Inn Hotel. And I, I got two big heavy books for um, my birthday. And one of them was um, Peter Bruegel, you know, the big 
master of these giant, you know, medieval scenes of um, not quite heaven and hell. That's more Hermes Bosch, but, you know, kind of similar. And, um, and then I also got a, a book on Barnett Newman, who I didn't understand at all. So I was really interested. So I, I started to put a couple of um, abstract um, kind of designs of my own in the frames I, I make for my paintings. And so here on the right, this is uh, from a Barnett Newman painting um, from the Stages of the Cross painting, which is kind of funny. Um, it, another, this is a really big painting. It's actually like 80 by 30 inches. Um, and these are all oil, by the way. I'll, I'll show you some more mediums I do, but I just want to show you the oil first. Um, it is kind of inspired by a John Singer Sargent painting. Um, he did a lot of these society paintings. So you always have people standing in these tall kind of rectangular um, formats, but um, I decided to do mine a little more contemporary. And I, I have a thing for dolls. I like I like Pooty a lot. Um, they're actually supposed to be like cherubs. And, you know, you see those a lot in a lot of places and fountains and, and paintings and stuff, but they're these little kind of like sprightly uh, ethereal figures I like to hide in all my paintings. Um, this is a portrait commission I made. Um, I did an album cover one time and, and uh, uh, I ended up making a, a second portrait just for fun of the singer. Um, it's a self-portrait, again, with a self-made frame, still alive. Um, so yeah, I, I like to do a lot of like life-size portraits for some reason. the life size it goes kind of back to Caravaggio and you know a lot of kind of giant baroque paintings with a lot going on a lot of kind of motion and you know vanitas themes and um I I like to collect props a lot so when I travel I I'm always bringing back a doll or or a dress or something and and I end up making uh paintings out of all the things I go collect so, so when I teach, I, I usually don't teach something this big. Like this is a, you know, a, you could say a multi-figure painting and it's 64 by 44 inches. I, I usually teach portrait. So something more like this is a little more manageable for, you know, uh, four days to a week. I one time, one time I taught a class with, with this complexity and it was a month long class and, and we were painting five days a week. Um, I also teach still life. You know, something like this is, is manageable as well. Oil painting is kind of slow, at, at least the way I do it. Um, a, a piece like this could take two weeks to a month. And, and a piece like this, though, paradoxically, I did in two days. Um, you, I don't know if you can tell on the screen that there is a little bit more freedom with the brushwork here. But, um, you know, a lot of times painting is just a spontaneous thing. So you are reacting to your circumstances and, and your mood and, and your inspiration level and and uh, usually the more time you put into it, the faster it goes, at least that's how I feel about it. This was the painting that was for an album cover. Let's see, okay, so I will show some drawings, I think. Let's see. <clears throat> yeah, so I, I like oil painting. Um, but I also like to do just some like more study kind of stuff. So this is a watercolor I've done. And, oh, I did some figure, figure drawing. This is a sketch from a church when I, I love to travel. So, so before coronavirus happened, I used to be like four, three or four months out of the year in Europe, usually in this kind of summer and uh, fall time. And so this was a church in Paris that I went into when it was raining um, and I kind of sat down and did a walnut ink sketch. And this was a church in Prague that I uh, did a similar sketch. And this was in Barcelona and Barcelona and that's my studio. So I, I, I do like to sketch as well. And I do a lot of this just on loose paper. So um, it's, it's kind of the antithesis of like a long drawn out oil painting. It's kind of a nice, fresh, um, fun thing to do. And then, um, I, I do a lot of uh, charcoal portraits as well. So just kind of very expressive. Um, I, I heard you guys talking about the, I don't know the Kurataki inks, but I do use a lot of um, Japanese Sumi ink. And then I use um, uh, Chinese watercolors and, and Japanese inks that are colored as well. So um, I'm always kind of exploring and 
uh, it looks like a collage, but it's not. It's all done on, on one sheet of paper. But I'm um, really interested in kind of rolling out like large, big sheets of paper on the floor and just painting on the floor. So I'll do that every once in a while. It, it, it looks a little bit like this when I do that. It's a charcoal portrait with some white chalk. And this is another <clears throat> class I do a lot. Um, can be done either from photographs or from a, a sitting model. Usually it's a sitting model um, in a class. Yeah, so I, I do enjoy this as well. So let me see. I guess I was gonna show you guys um, <clears throat> a little bit of painting just for fun. Sure. <clears throat> okay, so um, this is a portrait I started about almost a year ago. I was, I was in um, Delaware on the beach and I um, had been working on a, just, just the portrait alone for my, uh, one of my online classes. I've been taking, teaching online classes during the pandemic. And um, I decided after just blocking in the man's head that I was going to take it further. So I decided to bring some of the imagery from my trip to the beach. So I started going at it. And um, I thought it would be really fun to kind of bring some of the aspects of the Peter Bruegel paintings that I like and those kind of blues that you see in the old master paintings. And um, I use a lot of modern pigments like like cobalt blue and, and ultramarine blue, but I do have a couple of the old, uh, like the lapis lazuli and the malachite. So um, I'll show you those really quick. So I decided to do that. So here it is, let's see. Well, here's a, here's a chunk of um, malachite actually. So here's what it looks like when it's all ground up before it gets any oil put into it. Um, and then here's the lapis. So these are really old colors that um, are sort of very prized and we don't really need to use them these days, but a lot of people who paint icons use them. And um, every once in a while I'll do a, uh, just for fun, kind of an old master copy um, within a painting of my own. So I, uh, I do collect a lot of those colors for that reason. But, but yeah, this is a painting that's almost done and it's pretty dry. And so at this point, I would do what we call glazing, which is using a uh, transparent color over a dry color. So I thought I'd just do some glazing for you guys since we're all here together. So I'm gonna use my lapis lazuli and look at the back and think, I think you wanna get a little bit more um, depth into the, uh, into the background. Um, at the moment, this side is a little bit darker and more in light and this side is a little bit more cloudy, which you do get at the beach, you know, when you have that kind of really wide vista, you might have a cloud putting shadow on one side, and then the other side is like, you know, bright sunlight. So it's, um, it's, it's not an effect that I'm against, but I think I would like to just see what if I, what if I can do if I can maybe just darken something. Yeah, I'm just using the pure color lapis lazuli. I'm not mixing it with anything. That's historically what this color would have been um, uh, applied as. It, it, it was, it's actually kind of a grainy, weak color. So um, a lot of the modern colors are um, a lot more expressive and you can mix them together. And, and, I, and I use a lot of the modern colors, but um, sometimes it's nice to just be able to point at a painting and go, that's lapis lazuli. You know, it has something in common with um, Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel paintings and, and uh, you know, other, other masters from the past. So I just kind of enjoy putting it in only at the end, partly because it's so um, rare and expensive. I don't want to just put it in an underpainting. But there you can see it's just kind of bright and it's continuing this line over here. 
And at this point, you know, the painting's almost done. Um, and I've, and I've been painting, you know, um, Skip, the man's portrait from life. And, you know, I've been visiting the beach and I've been, um, working this all out, you know, with memory and photographs. And at this point, it's just kind of nice to just go with imagination and just finish it off. So I like to teach a couple of things. Like I like to teach drawing skills, such as you saw on my, my website. Um, but then I like to teach imagination and just enjoyment of, um, you know, wandering through a beautiful place like the outdoors or, or Europe or something. Um, and then, and then somehow kind of bringing it back to the studio and making an original piece of art and a truly original piece, I think as well. I like to treat, I like to teach, um, kind of coming up with your own ideas and, uh, you know, making those things happen. So I think that is something that I could teach. So somewhere between, you know, skill, but then also, um, yeah, the imagination and inspiration. So let's see, I could just keep going. Um, part of the reason I'm only showing a little bit here is there's no way I could make a whole painting in 30 minutes, but you know, not, not many people can. So I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna leave that and I'm gonna talk about, I don't know how much time I have, uh, some other things. You have plenty of time. You have plenty of time? Another okay. 15 minutes if you'd like, sure. Okay, I'll, I'll just, uh, maybe show a few more things from my uh from my website well i'll be actually talking about my studio um this is just one corner of it but i have some props up there so i have some of those those dolls i was painting and i've sculpted them all um from a, a clay called super sculpty and then i've painted them and found dresses and so i like to um create some of my props as well um, and then I've got some roses from the garden and giant library of books back there, um, painting supplies. So um, just, just everything for like kind of a happy creative studio space. Uh, where are you living? Um, Washington, DC. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, uh, I like it here a lot and um, yeah, before the pandemic, I was I was traveling a lot too. I used to do about one travel workshop a month on average. So I was all over Europe and Canada and, and the United States and exploring. So so whenever I came home, you know, it would just be like painting time. So very much just uh, throwing myself into the painting. Oh, I know. I want to show um, some of my ink drawings, my newer ink drawings. But they're kind of fun. So kind of as a, uh, uh, I don't know, something I started about uh, a year ago, um, I started just making really simple um, ballpoint pen drawings on uh, small sketchbook paper. And I'd, I'd often just go out into the, the woods, more like a park, you know, I'd go out into a park um, and around the trees and everything, and I'd just make portraits. And then... Um, I'd post them online and then I'd, I'd have someone want to buy it right away. So then we'd have a little conversation. It was right when the pandemic started. So I'd be like, well, how, how are things out in Prague? You know, we'd compare notes about uh, the life, the life during lockdown and it was kind of fun. And then I'd go home and paint. And then uh, so every day I was just making a drawing and um, pen and ink was not something I was very proficient at. Um, because I did so much oil painting and, and, you know, with oil painting, you can really layer and blend and fix mistakes. And uh, with pen and ink, you can't, but um, I kind of enjoy embracing the mistakes and then working them into new compositions. And so I really like the indelible quality of, of ink. And um, after some time, I started to do uh, calligraphy ink and calligraphy nips. So, so that kind of presented a little more color and expressive quality with, with the nib sizes um there's just a picture of my desk with some watercolors some uh props some materials like i really love line quality so it's something i like following uh, more desk pictures more drawings
I, I do enjoy a lot of florals as well. So I, I do like to paint a lot of um, flowers. And sometimes I like to say I, it's almost like I paint uh, still lives with people in them. Um, so I, I rarely, very rarely just do a still life by itself. It's always something with uh, some kind of uh, creature or uh, person in it kind of hiding. Um, I like I like Gustav Klimt a lot. I think I said that I like the, the Viennese secessionists a lot. So I have a, a big mix of um, inspirations, but but I would say like most of my work's pretty um, uh, you know traditional in the sense that it's it's done on canvas um, or it's done on paper. So it's uh, it's something that's pretty portable, and, and a lot of people do it. It's just we all do it in different ways. Could you? Could you explain um, when you were using lapis lazuli? I mean, that's such a such a um, iconic and and historically important material. But um, so you make that into oil paint? Is that what you were just using? Was it an oil paint yeah. based on lapis? Yep. Yeah, it was just um, uh, pigment, and then it was uh, some oil. And there are a couple oils you can make paint with um, walnut oil, linseed oil, and um, poppy and, and, and sunflower and safflower. But, but linseed and walnut are the two most traditional because um, well, they're the best ones, basically. So those are, those are the ones that I have. And um, there are a lot of different kinds of, of methods of uh, curing the oil. There are like sun thickened, stand oil, and these do things like they polymerize, they polymerize the oil in a way that um, gives you all sorts of great handling and blending and textural qualities. And um, you, you really don't need to use um, like turpentine or any other kind of mediums like that. So it's a very simple kind of pigment and oil uh, method. And it's, it's more traditional too, to uh, the old masters. They were not using um, like, like solvents and things like that, which can be dangerous to breathe. And, um, yeah, except so it's 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 combining the best of both worlds, uh, like kind of historical methods with modern color, so and 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 modern subject matter. That's great. This was from a workshop I did in Mexico City. There was this great mask, um, and they gave it to me, which I was really happy about. But I just love painting this uh, Guatemalan uh, mask right here. Yeah, so I can more. understand totally your connection to Bruegel, but yeah. <laughs> Barrett Newman is a little more difficult to explain. What about Barrett Newman? I mean, he is the, you know, kind of one of the great color field painters, but I mean, is it is it the, the color? Is it the, how do you feel connected to Barrett Newman? Well, I think that um, being so close to the National Gallery in the East Wing, they have a really great tower with uh, Rothko and then um, Barnett Newman, um, like on either side, and you're just surrounded by these big paintings. And I think there's some skylight and then there's one bench and not many people know about this, this tower. So it's usually very quiet. Um, and so it's just a nice contemplative kind of like chapel like space. So I think wow. I, I got interested just because I live so close to the museums that um, you know, I, I would go like once a week or something like that. So, so it became just a nice uh, place to, to spend time. And um, so I got curious about it as well. That's great. That's great. And I, I just like learning new things. So things I don't have that much familiarity with, like I, it wasn't part of my education, really, um, the modern art. So I was curious. I wonder if Ben has been up there. Ben, have you, have you been to the tower with the Rothkos and Newmans? No, the, this museum has masterpieces all over the place. So it's uh, if you want to select something, it's a great place to go because it has a little bit of everything. Uh -huh. It's so. well displayed too. It's the experience is very much uh, put at the forefront for viewers. Great. So did you uh, bring any questions to ask people who have been to La Ramita before, Teresa? Oh, sure. I'm very, I'm very um, interested in the uh, studio facility. Um, 
because I'm a studio painter, but also the weather and, and uh, like what the town looks like and, you know, are there any churches with paintings or museums nearby? You know, just curious. We're full of churches. <laughs> <laughs> you just Great. have to choose which one. Great. <laughs> The uh, I, I think that, you know, our uh, <clears throat> it, it seems sometimes that you are um, transported when you visit many of these towns into, you know, centuries past because there is just kind of nothing out of place, you know, just um, the restorations have always been so, well, not always, but so frequently in Italy. The restorations are so respectful of the past and involve a lot of study about colors and shapes and everything that 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 people maintain. Um, I was wondering, like when you when you teach something like this, uh, Teresa, when you're um, in a studio situation, is there a um, a, a certain aspect of um, that you find most easily transferable to a student from a teacher? I mean, is there, um, you know, we're not going to become, take a, a workshop and, and become like as good as the teacher or something, but what is it that, that strikes you that you find easy, most easily transferable to you know, to to opening the creativity of your of your students, you know, or to giving them a route toward that kind of creative expression. Yeah, I usually focus on on technique and and learnable skills so that people can um, increase, you, you know, usually drawing or painting ability or ability to see. Um, and, and usually with with this kind of oil painting, it has to do with drawing skills like perspective, um, proportion, if you're dealing with people. Um, and then it has to do with um, being able to see value and color properly. And, um, you know, we were discussing about like color and, you know, the more you paint, the more you can see color, it's true. So, so making people aware of color. And sometimes um, if, if, if skill is something that you want to improve, um, it can be really helpful to study with someone so they can look at your painting and, you know, kind of almost like, I don't know, like, like if you were a good swimmer, but you wanted better help with your stroke, you'd have a master swimmer be like, we'll do this with your arm and do this sure, and don't sure, breathe sure. for 50 meters. Like, I don't know, just <clears throat> like, you know, it's like that kind of thing. Um, but, but then also I, I've been told that people get very inspired as well. So, so a lot of it is just telling stories and, and people sharing their uh, artistic journeys and uh, discussing that. And then also like talking about art art history, contemporary art, um, and the direction people want to go in or um, what they're observing in the art world, you know, that we talk about that at the same time. So it's got practical and then it's also got all the other stuff as well mixed right. up with it. Do you, could you comment on that Isadora as well? Like um, you are muted right now, but there you go. <clears throat> about the, just, you know, how you relate to your students. Like, what is it that you, you find is the, the moment of, of transferal? Like, what, how do you get to that point? Um, well, I think I've been teaching for 15, 20 years. <laughs> but I think the most exciting thing as an educator is to see that person's voice come alive in the ways that um, they want it to come alive. So I think that individually, like our students always have goals or they have ideas of where they want to be. Um, and then just helping to get them to that place. But also um, to me, a lot of it is actually self-confidence and, and, and people being very confident in their own voice and how gorgeous that is, right? Like we all have different handwriting and everybody's handwriting is very different. Um, and, and that's what's most interesting to me is to see the difference in each person and, and how their individual voice um, can be illuminated in a different kind of way. Um, wow. So that's, that's what I think about when I think about teaching, like there's the objectives to get there, but everybody's stuff isn't going to look the same. And that is like the gorgeousness. That's the great stuff is getting to see how that person translates that idea and this person, you know, sure. so that's what. I enjoy about teaching different skills because they should, you know, all these things kind of develop and show you what everybody has 
has translated it into. Sure, sure. No, that's that's fantastic. I think that um, both of you have shown a bunch of skills. I, I always think of these um, <clears throat> that painters uh, being a writer. Um, the tools are not all that important. You know, we can do on a prison wall with a bloody finger if we have to. But I'm I'm just really exaggerating. Um, <laughs> But, um, you know, just having a typewriter or a pencil and a napkin, but um, the tools available to creative artists to, in the plastic arts are just astonishing. And both of you are bringing such really unique tools to this. I, I think that it's really fascinating. I'm really excited about doing something with y'all. I think we're close to the end here. Does anyone want to make a comment or? It's been fabulous. I enjoyed both. Both it's and the the work from both artists is so very different, and it's 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 was very very exciting to see both. I agree. I Thank agree. you. Thank you. So, well, we will all be talking more in the future, and um, please, everybody, pay attention to our uh, website as we update what our schedule is going to be next year but we're pretty excited about having these amazingly talented people involved. Mm. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Edmund. Thank, Thank you, well. Isadora. Bye. Thank you, Teresa, so much. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you all. Yes, Bye, you everybody. Bye. Ciao, ciao. So, Valerio, you're...